Occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beat sound. You will have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Brian Harris. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, last year I had a traumatic injury to my left posterior. I got hit from a boat while I was in the water. I immediately rushed to the hospital where I had to undergo surgery. I am still having an external fixation on the wound for healing fractures in the leg. I had undergone grafting and full thickness skin grafting close to defects in my posterior thigh. It is almost healed right in the gluteal fold on the left area. In several areas along the graft site and low in the leg, there is several hypergranulation tissue developed. Is there any bleeding from the wound? No, Doctor. Okay, what's your age? Forty-two, Doctor. Do you drink or smoke? No, Doctor. Had any other illnesses in the past? Nothing other than Clostridium difficile in the recent past. Are you taking any medication? I'm taking Cipro and Flagyl. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, Doctor. Any illness history of family members? My maternal grandmother had pancreatic cancer. My father had prostate cancer and he has heart disease and diabetes. Well, your physical examination results are perfectly okay. Cardiology reports are regular. There is no S3, S4 or gallop. There is no murmur. Abdomen is soft. It is non-tender. There is no mass or organomedulli. Your right lower extremity is unremarkable. Peripheral pulse is good. Your left lower extremity is significant for the split thickness skin graft closure of a large defect in the posterior thigh, which is nearly healed. Hypergranulation tissue both on your gluteal folds on the left side. There is one small area right essentially within the graft site and there is one small area down lower on the calf area. There's an external fixation on that comes out laterally on your left thigh. The pin sites look clean. There are several multiple areas of hypergranulation tissue on the left posterior leg associated with a sense of trauma to your right posterior leg. I would recommend series of treatment with chemical cauterization of these areas till these are closed. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24.
started up onto the computer uh, later on. Okay. So just in your own words, tell me what's brought you in today. Um, well, I've been getting some diarrhoea, really, mm -hmm. yeah, for the last sort of, well, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so before two or three weeks, no problems, really? Um, so before that, uh, no, no, I mean, I, no, I've just been going normally, which is once every couple of days or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no problems normally. Okay, so just tell me a little bit more about the diarrhoea, what it's like and things like that. Um, so like what, what, what my poo looks mm. like, sort of thing. Mm. Okay, um, so that's, it's quite... Run, it's runnier, yeah, sort of looser yeah. than normal. I don't think there's any change in that colour or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably, um, but uh, but I'm just going a lot more often. Yeah. Can I just check? Do you have any blood in it at all? Oh um, gosh, yes. I, I'm surprised I haven't said that already. Mm -hmm. It's worrying me. Um, yeah, th that I've had um, for a couple of a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And is it difficult to flush away at all? No, oh, no, no. It's not difficult mm -hmm. to flush away. Yeah. And do you ever see any food that's not digested properly in it? Not no, that wouldn't be something. No. Mm -hmm. no. So you said diarrhea, but how many times a day does it actually happen? Um, well, I would say somewhere between. Well, at the moment, probably somewhere like yesterday it was probably about eight times. Eight times, yeah, oh yeah. dear. I mean, I don't don't think it's been like that every day for the yeah, last three sure. weeks, but but up to eight times up a to day. Eight times, yeah. yeah. Do you have to get up at night to go to the yes, toilet? Yes, yeah. Oh dear. yeah, yeah. And I've never had to do that before. And you're losing sleep over it. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. Mm -hmm. And do you have any tummy pain at all? Yes, um, yeah, that's it's quite sort of crampy, um, mm -hmm. mainly just before I, I go to the toilet, but it can be at other yeah. times. But then does that pain go away once you've been to the toilet? Um, yeah, a little bit, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say so, a, a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And does anything make the pain worse at all? Um, I, just eating, I do not that I can really mm. think of. And you pointed to your tummy. Mm. Exactly where is it? It is. It is just sort of around the middle, yeah. really. Yeah. And how do you describe that pain? Um, I sort of. It's sort of sort of crampy. Crampy I guess. is what yeah. you said, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And how bad is it? Um. Oh, no, if the ten was excruciating, mm. and one was very little pain. Then where would you put it? It's not, it's not, yeah, I've had worse, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so uh, probably about four. Yeah, yeah. so it's not agonising, no, but it no. certainly is there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, and, it, and you've told me about when it comes on and mm. what makes it a little bit better and worse as well, yeah. which is good. So I'm just going to ask the rest of the questions just about the, the whole gut itself. Mm. Do you have any difficulty chewing your food at all? Oh, no, no. No, no mouth ulcers or anything like that? Um, no. Any no. difficulty swallowing your food no. at all? Do you ever get indigestion? No. Not really? Uh, well, sometimes, maybe on a maybe on a weekend. Okay. Sometimes. Okay, but but not usually. No, not okay. Usually. So this was only about three weeks ago that, that you've had yeah, the problem. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and prior to that, uh, what what was your bowel habit like? Don't go that often, really. It's sort mm -hmm. of maybe once a day, once every two days. Once a day, once every two days. Yeah. But certainly no diarrhea. Oh no. A, a normal form. Still. No, it's quite harder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But no blood, not no. black at all. No. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for that. On to your past medical history. Any operations in the past at all? Um, yeah, I did when I was, I was sort of in my teens. Probably, I think I was about fifteen. Um, I had um, um, my appendix removed. In your teens, okay, yeah. but nothing since then. No, no, um, no, no operations since then. No. Okay. Uh, you said that you take a little bit of paracetamol for for your headaches. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, are you doing any of the medicines at all? Um, just well, I've, uh, the pill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, no, nothing, nothing else. No, nothing else at all. Okay, uh, and nothing else over the counter. No, just paracetamol yeah. for my headache. Uh, any recreational drugs at all? No. Okay, okay. And uh, are you allergic to anything? Oh, um, yes. Um, I'm allergic to um, amoxicillin. So mm -hmm. is that penicillin? Yeah. So I'm allergic to penicillin. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what happens when you have penicillin? Oh, um, that's what I get. That's when you know talk about a rash. I get yeah. a rash. Oh, I see. So that's the rash. Well, no, I'm, but um, yeah. That's yeah. Thing. Okay. So rash with penicillin. Mm. So who's with you at home? Um. Yeah. So I live with my partner Sam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. No particular problems there at all. No. 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 Okay. Been about three years. Uh, is there any family history of note? Uh. No. Not that I'm aware of. Anyway. So no gut conditions in the family. My aunt. My aunt. Maybe. Um. My aunt had something to do with her tummy, but I don't know what it was really. Okay. Um, it wasn't cancer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just moving towards the end, I just wanted to explore your ideas, concerns and expectations really. So what do you think is going on with this problem? Well, I, I, oh, 
think it could be um, an infection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. An, an infection, yeah. Mm. And you told me about one of your concerns about passing it on to people yeah, at work, and especially yeah, the children, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But um, any other concerns? Well, they pass at all? on to me. Yes. Um, my sister, my um, friend's sister, mm -hmm. has got bowel cancer she's only 30 oh dear uh oh. and so it's just the bleeding really yes, more than anything yeah. that's worried me um so mm -hmm. i wondered about that really mm -hmm. i mean if you I mean, told me that we'll we'll try and reassure you and mm -hmm. let's see what, what what turns out in your yeah. case what do you think we need to do today to help you well i wondered if i might need some tests i mean i'm really hoping because i did have a little look on the internet and i'm really hoping it's not going to be one of you know the cameras i mm -hmm. think colonoscopy or something yeah. like that um yeah, I, I, I'm hoping I don't have to have that. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, um, I think I've got um, everything. There. Is there anything else that you want to tell me? Actually, I've just remembered, I, I forgot to ask you about travel. Uh, have you had any travel in the last few months or weeks even? No, no, no. no I haven't been away anywhere. Okay, no. and you can't distinctly say that um, this is due to a particular food that you've had or... No. And nobody else has had this problem no. in your family. No, no. Just wanted to check that. Yeah. Okay, so is there anything else that you want to tell me about this problem? Um, no, I, I, oh, I did, did go travelling about three years ago to Africa. All oh, right, three years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. To, um, to, well, to South Africa. And, South Africa. And, um, and up into Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. But were you well there, though? Yeah, I was yeah. well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do you have any questions for me? Um, no. How likely is it that I'm going to have a camera well I think initially we'll probably run some blood tests okay. and do the stool sample right. uh, and make sure there's no infection then I probably need to get uh, a gut specialist to have a look at you uh, okay. if it hasn't got better in a matter of weeks That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25. You hear a discussion about common types of neuropathic pain. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. What are the common types of neuropathic pain? Well, while there are countless types of neuropathic pain, 
Some of the prominent types include carpal tunnel syndrome. It's caused by nerve compression in the wrists and causes pain in the wrist, thumb and fingers. Central pain syndrome can occur after nervous system damage, such as a stroke. Degenerative disc disease one may feel neuropathic back pain if it causes damage to the nerves entering or exiting the spine. Diabetic neuropathy causes stabbing pain in the hands and feet of some diabetic patients. Phantom limb pain can occur in some patients after a limb is amputated. Postlipetic neuralgia is brought on by an outbreak of shingles and persists after the condition has cleared. Pudendal neuralgia is a type of pelvic pain caused by compression of the pudendal nerve. Sciatica is caused by compression or irritation of the sciatic nerve and often results in shooting pain that radiates down the back of the leg. Trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by shooting neck and facial pain. Question 26. You hear a discussion bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what are the different types of bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are often prescribed a bronchodilator, a type of medication for relaxing the air passages to help breathe better. Typically, the medications are inhaled through the mouth using a metered dose inhaler, but also come in liquid, pill, injectable or suppository formulations. The three classes of bronchodilators commonly used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are beta-adrenergic, beta-agonists, anticholinergics, methylxanthines. Beta-adrenergic agonists are a type of medication that binds to specific receptors in the lung called beta-adrenoceptors. By doing so, they block the trigger to bronchial spasms and allow airway passages to open. Beta-agonists can either be short-acting or long-acting, which are delivered either orally or through a metered dose inhaler. Generally, the inhaled method is preferred as it alleviates symptoms faster. Anticholinergic blocks the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the central and the peripheral nervous system to its receptor in nerve cells and inhibit parasympathetic nerve impulses. Methylxanthines affect not only the airways but stimulate heart rate, force of contraction and cardiac arrhythmias at high concentrations. Question 27. You hear a discussion about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, read the question. Doctor, what are the various types of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? There are different kinds of functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Gastronomy usually forms in the head of the pancreas and sometimes forms in the small intestine. Most gastronomas are malignant. Insulinoma forms in the head, body or tail of the pancreas. Insulinomas are usually benign. Glucogenoma forms in the tail of the pancreas. Most glucogenomas are malignant. VIPomas, which make vasoactive intestinal peptide. Somatostatinomas, which make somatostatin. Question 28. You hear a discussion about melasma and different types of melasma. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. What is melasma and what are the types of melasma? Well, melasma is a common patchy brown, tan or blue-grey facial skin discoloration, normally seen in women during their reproductive period. It typically appears on the upper lips, upper cheeks, forehead and chin of women of 20 to 50 years of age. There are four types of pigmentation patterns are diagnosed in melasma. 
epidermal, dermal, mixed, and an unnamed type found in dark-complexioned individuals. The epidermal type is characterized by the presence of excess melanin in the superficial layers of skin. Dermal melasma is defined by the presence of melanophages throughout the dermis. The mixed type includes both the dermal and epidermal type. In the fourth type, excess melanocytes are present in the skin of dark-skinned individuals. Question 29. You hear a discussion about possible causes of arthritis. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. Can you tell me what are the possible causes of arthritis? Osteoarthritis is associated with cartilage damage. Genetic conditions are thought to play a role in osteoarthritis. Age alone is no longer seen as the cause of osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that develops as the immune system malfunctions and attacks the body's own tissues. Gout develops when excessive uric acid accumulates in the body and crystals are deposited in the joints. Reactive arthritis causes joints to become inflamed as a result of an infection that triggers the immune system. Usually, this condition resolves. Question 30. You hear a monologue of a physician on granulomas. Now, read the question. Granulomas are tissue nodules of immune cells that occur in diseases such as sarcoidosis and tuberculosis that can damage many organs. It is the chronic activation of the metabolic sensor mammalian target of rapamycin that is responsible for the granuloma's formation. In sarcoidosis, this mechanism leads to a course that is chronic and difficult to treat. Since mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors belong to a group of drugs already licensed for clinical use, these findings offer new and quickly testable treatment options. This is the end of part B. Now, 
Look at part C. Part C, questions 31 to 42. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now, look at extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Now, answer question one. The word migraine is derived from the Greek word meaning pain in half the head, as migraine often produces a unilateral or one-sided headache. It is a common and distressing disorder, and although they are not likely to take life, migraines can destroy the quality of life. Studies have shown the incidence of migraine to be in the range of 9 to 10 percent and it affects 17 percent of the female population and 6 percent of the male population. So about 2 million Australians can expect to suffer from migraine uh, and that translates to 1.5 million women and about 500,000 men. It is thought that more women suffer migraine than men due to hormonal factors. There are several types of migraine, the two main types being classical migraine and common migraine. Classical migraines are preceded by an aura, the duration of which varies between 15 minutes up to almost an hour. The headache usually lasts 6 to 8 hours, although they can last up to 72 hours. Common migraines are not preceded by an aura and the headache lasts between 4 and 72 hours and can be pulsating and unilateral. An upset stomach and vomiting are common symptoms. Migraines can be divided into a number of distinct phases. The first phase includes the early warning symptoms. A significant number of migraine sufferers experience warning symptoms for up to 24 hours before the attack start, but may not recognize these signs unless they know what to look for. The common symptoms include changes in mood, and these moods can vary from elation, such as feeling on top of the world and full of energy, to opposite moods, such as feeling depressed and irritable. There are several abdominal symptoms common to migraine, including nausea, changes in appetite, such as intense hunger or sugar craving, constipation, and diarrhea. 
Neurological changes may also occur prior to the migraine, including drowsiness, incessant yawning, symptoms of dysphagia, such as difficulty in finding the right words, a reaction to excessive brightness or sound, and difficulty in eye focus. There may also be changes in behaviour, such as hyperactivity, clumsiness, or lethargy. And many sufferers report muscular symptoms, such as general aches and pains. The second phase is the aura. The aura accompanies migraine attacks in about 20 to 30 percent of migraine sufferers. The most common aura symptoms are visual disturbances such as bright zigzag lines and flashing lights. As well as that, there may be difficulty in focusing or blind spots. The aura commonly affects only one eye, but it can disturb the visual field of both eyes. It usually lasts between 5 and 60 minutes, then the vision normally returns to normal. Less commonly, aura affects sensation or speech. The third phase is the headache. The headache phase can last for up to three days. It is often throbbing and on one side of the head, but it can affect both and it is made worse by any kind of movement. The most common accompanying symptoms in this phase are uh, sensitivity to light, sound and smell. Eating can help reduce symptoms, especially starchy foods such as breads and pastas. The symptoms can be more distressing than the headache itself. The final recovery stage may last for about 24 hours and feelings range from complete lethargy to feelings of high energy and even euphoria. Sleep often is beneficial for adults while effective medication can improve attacks for chronic sufferers. Children seem to feel much better after vomiting, and for a few, nothing works except the headache burning itself out. The dietary triggers include alcohol, especially red wine, certain types of food, notably aged cheese or chocolate, uh, withdrawal from caffeine or caffeinated drinks such as coffee and tea, the food additive, monosodium glutamate, dehydration, and inadequate meals. Environmental triggers include bright sunlight, flickering lights, strong smells, for example, perfume, gasoline, uh, chemicals, smoke-filled rooms, and certain food odors. Another environmental trigger is high altitudes, or flying. Weather changes can be a trigger factor, as can loud noises or overuse or incorrect use of computers. Other trigger factors include the hormonal triggers. Hormonal fluctuations are implicated as a significant trigger for women, as three times as many women suffer from migraine headaches as men. This difference being most apparent during the reproductive years. The hormonal triggers may be menstruation, and a UK study found that 50% of women are more likely to have migraine around menstruation, ovulation, use of oral contraceptives, pregnancy, and it may be worse for the first few months, but in two-thirds of women it improves in the latter part. The physical and emotional factors which can trigger migraine include a lack of sleep or oversleeping, and even as little as half an hour difference in routine, such as sleeping in on the weekends, can make that difference. Illness, such as a viral infection or a cold, stiff and painful muscles, especially in the scalp, jaw, neck, shoulders and upper back, sudden or vigorous exercise, emotional triggers such as arguments or excitement, and relaxation after stress.
which is known as the weekend headache. There are a variety of treatments available for migraine sufferers, and non-medication treatments such as ice can, in some cases, reduce the impact of a migraine episode. This is because, during a migraine, the blood vessels in the head tend to dilate, which means they open more widely. They may become swollen with blood, and this in turn leads to pressure on the nerves surrounding them. The nerves begin to send pain signals before the onset of migraine. Wrapping the head with an ice pack can bring migraine relief through the cooling of the blood vessels. As the blood vessels cool, they become constricted and return to normal size. This can lessen blood flow to the head and as a result reduce pressure on the nerves thereby providing relief from pain. Another non-medication treatment is biofeedback. The biofeedback technique trains people to improve their health by controlling certain bodily processes that normally happen involuntarily, such as heart rate, blood pressure and muscle tension. Relaxation techniques may also be helpful at stopping an attack once it has started. The techniques include deep breathing, massage and stretching. Individuals with occasional mild migraine headaches that do not interfere with daily activities usually medicate themselves with over-the-counter non-prescription pain relievers such as paracetamol, aspirin or NSAIDs like ibuprofen. For people who suffer migraines very frequently, prophylactic medication that is taken on a daily basis may be a good option. As a general rule, patients who experience migraines twice or more per month or have migraines which interfere with their quality of life may benefit from this type of medication. Now, turn over and look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
I'm here with Dr. Jeffrey McLean, who's an expert in neuromuscular disease. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you become a neuromuscular disease expert? Well, uh, my, I started out with my general neurology training, uh, which I did at Wilford Hall Medical Center. And from there, I did a fellowship in neuromuscular medicine at, before returning to where I am now. And what's your typical day like? What kinds of patients do you see? I, I see a fairly broad mix of patients, uh, but when I'm doing specifically neuromuscular medicine, I do a lot of procedures, uh, electromyography, which is a procedure that we use to help diagnose neuromuscular diseases. The type of patients we see range from patients with neuropathies um, to patients with muscle diseases so that we call myopathies, to patients with disorders of the connection between the nerves and the muscles, neuromuscular junction disorders such as myasthenia gravis, uh, to problems with the motor neurons such as ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So a variety of very common diseases and some that are more rare and, and very uh, have very serious prognoses. Exactly, that's right. And uh, what is the most exciting new development in your field? Which of those conditions have something new to offer patients who are listening? I think perhaps the most exciting field where we've seen a lot of attention recently is, has been ALS, especially with the ice bucket challenge recently mm -hmm. that garnered so much public attention, so much public excitement. That excitement has transferred into more attention, more funding for more research. Things that are looking at improving our understanding of the genetics that play into ALS, where there's a lot of work being done trying to find biomarkers, so things that can be tested easily to more readily diagnose ALS and understand how it progresses in a particular patient. All these things ultimately help us find and uh, research uh, possible treatments that in the end are, are hopefully will lead us to things that will really benefit patients. And up until now there really has not been a great deal to offer an ALS patient. What, what do you do today? The, right now what we're focused on is improving the quality of life while people are dealing with this disease and that's an important thing for both patients and physicians to understand that while we don't have a cure there are many things that can be done to significantly improve the quality of life for our patients so things like help with communication because many of the patients lose the ability to control their voice and control their speaking so we can do things to help them communicate as that occurs things uh, like assistance with nutrition because they have difficulty swallowing and eating so helping them with that one of the big and often under-recognized problems with ALS are mood problems that go along with it. Um, obviously, it's a devastating diagnosis, and um, the social support is very important that we offer that to our patients to make sure that their, um, again, their quality of life is, is as high as possible while dealing with this. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, neuropathies for which we can offer a whole variety of treatments. Is there anything new or exciting for the patient with diabetes or someone else with, with neuropathy to consider? Well, again, there, there's a lot of new research going on. There's a, a lot of exciting um, work in terms of trying to find ways to treat the, the pain, often painful diabetic neuropathies. That there are already some drugs currently available that many patients will be familiar with. And as time goes forward, we hope to increase the number of drugs that are available to make them more effective with fewer side effects. So hopefully that will be very soon on the horizon. That is the end of part C.